Some murders solve themselves on the spot. Some takes months of grueling work to find a solution. Some might take years, and yet, some are never solved. At some point, the families of the victims begin to wonder if they will ever get answers or closure, while other families let go and lose any hope. What else would you do when a couple of months of investigation turns into a couple of decades? Thankfully, some of them don't have to wait any longer because the cold cases that no one could find answers for finally got solved this year. Here are the stories of Denise Marie Stafford, Sonia Carmen Hero Stone, Roberto Wagner Fernandez, Michelle Wyatt, Althea Oakley, and Caitlin Arquette. Let's begin. Denise Marie Stafford. On the 13th of October, 1985, the Sarasota Police Department received calls that led them to the house of a 28-year-old mother, Denise Marie Stafford. Her husband had gotten to her home on Tarpon Avenue when he discovered her body. Their only child, a daughter who was one year at the time, was in another room, had not been hurt, and was alive when the police arrived. At the time, Neighbors described her as a peaceful, fun-loving soul who was as kind as she was friendly. Everyone wondered who could have committed such a crime to such a beautiful woman. The police began investigations, and it was found that Denise had been killed between the late hours of the day before 11 p.m. October 12th and 3.10 a.m. October 13th. All of her items found at the scene were carefully examined in a bid to find who might have killed her that night but investigations were slowed down by limitations in technology and things slowly began to reach a halt. The first sign of hope, however, came when a suspect arose in the case, Joseph Magaletti Jr. He had worked as a bouncer in a now closed lounge and restaurant that Denise and her husband, Frank Stafford, used to frequent. However, the police had nothing to nail him to the crime and he was let go. Time passed and the case grew cold. However, in 2021, with improvements to DNA testing technology, the Sarasota Police Department decided to reopen the case. The civilian investigator, Jeff Birdwell, said that new evidence pointed to one fact. She was standing when she was attacked before being lifted and pinned to the ground. He thought about the places on her clothing the killer would have had to hold before they could do that and sent for testing. And when the results came back, they conclusively pointed to former suspect Joseph Magaletti Jr. as the killer. Great. Justice. But where was Magaletti now? Well, Magaletti had died in prison since 2015 at the age of 64 while he was serving life for strangling his former Sarasota neighbor, another victim named Kathleen Leonard. Ten years after the Stafford murder, it was a single strand of hair that led to Magaletti's arrest. But that's not all. He was also suspected but never charged with the killing of Elizabeth Zia, a 19-year-old lady who was kidnapped around Sarasota Square Mall and found dead in downtown Sarasota, a place where Elizabeth worked at the time. Joseph Magaletti would deny being involved with the killings till he died in prison. Even though the Stafford family could not get the closure they might have needed since Magaletti died in prison, her mother, Dolar Kipner, said this, He is gone. He is not going to harm anyone else. That has been my consolation. I didn't want to see any other mother go through what our family has. She was loving, she was a good daughter, and we just all loved her and miss her. Sonia Carmen Herrock Stone. In the 1970s, Sonia Carmen Herrock, mother of one child, recently divorced, moved from Quebec, Canada to Carmel, California. She got a job with Levi Strauss and worked as a sales representative. Then she got married to Michael Stone in 1976. They had a child together, but later divorced after a few years. After her divorce, she decided to stay back in California. Her life was nothing out of the ordinary up until the 15th of October, 1981, when around noon, Sonia's friend, 
Caroline McBride, found her friend's body, Sonia was 30 at the time of the murder, and had been killed in the early morning hours of that same day. Investigations began, but McBride, who had been the first on the crime scene after the act, was not charged as a suspect. The details of her crime scene would be instrumental to finding her killer later in this account. Firstly, there were signs of forced entry and possible signs of a struggle. All indicators pointed to a robbery, but nothing valuable was missing from her house. While not too much time had passed, the case seemed to stall until a supposed witness to the crime approached with her testimony. Michelle Wilson, who was a friend to a certain Michael Glazebrook, who lived just across the street from the victim, Sonia, implicated Glazebrook by stating that he was at the scene of the murder when the crime happened. To make matters more convenient, Michael Glazebrook also happened to have a scratch on his face that he had not explained to anyone. Could it be that Sonia had scratched his face while struggling with Glazebrook? Glazebrook didn't have a criminal record at the time, only traffic warrants that he had served hearings for. McBride, on the other hand, would state that Sonia didn't know Glazebrook at all. Still, things were looking up and a lead surfaced. However, investigations would hit yet another snag when Michelle Wilson would later come to retract her testimony on the 10th of November, 1982, claiming that the passing of time had made her uncertain about the events. She also said that Glazebrook had explained the scratch had come from an argument at a college the day after the murder. This counter-testimony appeared to snatch the oxygen out of the lungs of the case. In the trial, contradictory statements began to arise. Glazebrook's parents, Walter and Jean, testified that they hadn't seen any scratch on their son's face, and ultimately, the judge refused to rule Glazebrook as the murderer based on the fact that there was not enough evidence to tie him to the case. Subsequently, the case was dismissed. From here on, things began to get incredibly messy. Glazebrook was arrested and tried a second time. He pleaded not guilty. And for the second time, the judge threw out the case because the defendant had been questioned and arrested primarily for illegal purposes. Blood samples obtained from the suspect and statements that he made to a former FBI agent under duress was suppressed by the court on the grounds that any evidence uncovered was fruit from a poisonous tree. The reason for this was because he had been arrested for one purpose, traffic warrants, and then was dubiously questioned for another, the murder of Sonia. Still, witnesses, neighbors approached with new information that implicated Glazebrook further. Notes like, he was not home at the time of the murder. His green pickup truck was not in front of his house. Someone saw him driving away, and that scratch on his face had contradictory explanations. His explanation was the most intriguing. He said he was struck by a piece of plexiglass while he was working on a boat in the backyard of his home. This directly contradicted the testimony of Michelle, who said that he had explained it as getting hurt during an argument at a college. At this point, the question had become, who is lying? Still, the testimony of Dr. Robert Cushing, an emergency room physician at the community hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, exonerated him. He said that the laceration on Glazebrook's face was not consistent with the scratch from a fingernail and that he treated the wound himself the day after the murder. Witness reports also became complicated, and what was stated on paper was not what was said on the witness stand. To make matters even more complicated, the investigators admitted to having mistakenly destroyed their original outline-style notes after they had typed up the interview reports. Glazebrook further testified that he had played softball on the day of the murder, and yet none of the softball teammates were contacted. On the 8th of December, 1983, the murder charges were dropped for what seemed like the last time. The case grew cold as time passed, and justice seemed out of reach for the victim. However, in 2021, 40 years after the murder of Sonia Carmen Herrock Stone, detectives in California knocked on Glazebrook's door 
one more time with an arrest warrant of murder based on evidence gotten from Sonia Hirok case file, which was made possible with modern DNA technology. They finally had him, and there was nowhere for him to go. In honor of Carmen Stone's profession as a merchandiser for Levi Strauss, the detectives wore denim jeans to the scene of the arrest. Glazebrook is now 65 years old and is currently awaiting trial. His bail has been placed at $1 million, and he is currently awaiting trial for what everyone hopes will be the final time. The Three Florida Murders Florida has had its share of serial killers. There have been the insanely popular, almost culturally viral ones like Ted Bundy, Danny Rowling, and Aline Woronos, to the less known killers like Christine Falling and Gary Ray Bowles. However, while these murders got solved and the murderers got apprehended by the police, no series of Florida killings have been quite as mentally tasking and physically draining as the three Florida murders. The murders in question began in June 2000, when the body of a 35-year-old female named Kimberly Dietz Levisi was discovered in Cooper City, southwest of Fort Lauderdale. However, not too long after that incident, another body was found. This time, it was also a lady's. A woman named Sia Dimas, who was 21 at the time, was found near Dania Beach in the same county that Kimberly's body was found. Then a year later, yet another victim was found, the body of a 24-year-old Jessica Good found floating in Biscan Bay, Miami. The cases of these three females proved to be quite difficult. All three victims had something in common that made them easy targets for the serial killer. They were all prostitutes who had struggled with substance abuse and were vulnerable as a result. The first solid clue to solving the murders took place after the police had interviewed the last victim, Jessica Good's boyfriend. They were able to identify Roberto Wagner Fernandez as a suspect. He was also a Brazilian citizen living in Miami, and when word started going around that he might be a suspect on a case, he immediately fled to Brazil, which only made things worse. When he fled, detectives found it almost impossible to follow up the case with him because of several bureaucratic challenges. They refused to extradite him because he was a citizen of Brazil, not the United States of America. However, Fernandez failed to keep a low profile in his home country and continued with his crimes. A lot of his crimes were related to violence against sex workers in Brazil, and so the country became more cooperative with investigators, but still, the case progressed at an extremely slow pace. When, in 2011, investigators reached a break in the case of his third victim in the U.S., Jessica Good. Detectives immediately flew to Brazil to retrieve DNA evidence from Mr. Fernandez, only to find out that he had died in a plane crash on his way to Paraguay from Brazil in 2005. However, the detectives felt there was a conspiracy somewhere. In a conference, a detective named Scott said that there were a lot of circumstantial evidence that led them to believe that he might have faked his own death. This circumstantial evidence had the enemies he had acquired at the top of the list. Throughout his life, Fernandez had amassed so many enemies in Brazil that every one of them wanted him dead, from getting acquitted after murdering his wife to his wife's family wanting to kill him in return. It appeared like Fernandez was never far from trouble. So the detectives went on investigating, working with the Justice Department the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Brazilian National Police. After several years of back and forth between government bodies in two countries, a Brazilian judge was finally persuaded to authorize the exhumation of Mr. Fernandez's body. His grave was open, and his DNA profile proved to be very consistent with that found on all three victims found in the Florida killings. The Broward County Sheriff, Gregory Tony said that detectives, some retired, some now deceased, never stopped trying to solve the murders so the families of the victims would know what had happened to their loved ones. One thing that troubled investigators the most 
was the fact that Mr. Fernandez was never brought to justice for his crimes. However, Detective Scott would later say at a news conference that they wished they could bring him to justice, but unfortunately, they couldn't. Still, the fact that his last moments on Earth were filled with terror makes investigators feel a little better. Althea Oakley and Caitlin Arquette On the 22nd of June, 1988, a 21-year-old Althea Oakley went to a fraternity party with her boyfriend. A few hours into the night, the couple got into a fight that caused Oakley to decide to walk home by herself. On her way home, and while taking a familiar route that was close to the University of New Mexico, she was unfortunately attacked. A year would go by, and yet another case popped up. Not long after graduating from Highland High School, an 18-year-old Caitlin Arquette, the daughter of the famous horror thriller writer Lois Duncan, would get shot while she was driving home from a friend's house. The impact of these seemingly unrelated murders was devastating and resonant to their respective families. Lois Duncan immediately halted her career in the thriller and horror genre and started writing books for children while endlessly seeking answers. The Oakley family also sought answers for years. For more than 30 years, questions were asked to which no answer was given. However, on the 20th of July, 2021, almost 32 years after Arquette, a 53-year-old man called Paul Apodaca called the University of New Mexico police and told them he had information on murders from a long time ago. When he was engaged in a conversation, Apodaca proceeded to confess to the killing of both Arquette and Althea Oakley. Testimonies from Apodaca aligned with the accounts of both victims and the circumstances that led to their deaths. Apodaca would tell the police that he was employed as a security aide at what was once known as TVI, but is now known as Central New Mexico Community College. This is when he saw Oakley in the parking lot. After seeing her there, he gave a detailed account of how he got into his car and decided to follow her as she walked along Buena Vista Boulevard all the way to the Lobo parking lot. To make things a little more bizarre, he said that when she was walking past him, she actually said hi to him and smiled. That's the worst part, he said to the police. That's the worst part. I hurt someone that smiled at me. When he was asked what his motive was, Apodaca said, I think what made me do it, what made me attack her was all, all the hatred I had for women. Because growing up, I seen men treating women bad and they, they go for the bad guys. And I try to be nice and be good and they just didn't want that. So I was jealous and, and had hatred and I just released it. The Albuquerque police chief, Harold Medina, who also happens to be the first recipient of a scholarship set up in Oakley's name in 1990, personally made the drive to Taos to give Oakley's parents the news. In a news conference Tuesday, Harold said that when he arrived there, Oakley's mother thought he was there to tell them they had closed the case. It was a bittersweet ending that gave closure to the parents of the deceased that had waited for so many years for it. Apodaca's confession for Arquette's murder also matched and filled in gaps. He said that when she pulled up to an intersection, he shot at her. The car then proceeded to drift across three oncoming lanes of traffic before crashing into a light pole near Arno Street Northeast. Investigators came upon a gray Volkswagen Beetle whose owner was Apodaca and who was suspiciously parked near the scene of the crime, but no efforts were made to bring him into questioning. When asked what his motive was for killing her once again, he answered similarly. She was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Ironically, Paul Apodaca's job at TVI at the time was the supervision of parking lots and ensuring that girls got to their cars safely and that no one was breaking into cars. He had worked there from 1988 to 1990 and already had a violent criminal history dating back to when he was a juvenile. As recent as 2021, he had pleaded guilty to aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and was sentenced to supervised probation for three years. 
Apodaca is also homeless and has also confessed to killing a third woman in 1988. Police say they believe they know the identity of the other woman he confessed to killing and are talking to her family, but add they're not ready to release her name. At this moment, the police say they have charged Apodaca with murder in the first degree in the death of Oakley, and that is the only case he has been charged in because that is the case they have the most evidence in right now. However, with more time, evidence, and his confessions, more charges will be leveled against him. Given everything that happened, an officer asked Apodaca why he chose to confess, and Apodaca opened up to him. Apodaca looked at the officer and said that it was a shame that it took him so long to get to this point. He also told him that he now realized that what he did was evil and dark, and that it was the word of God that helped him overcome his struggle. Michelle Wyatt Michelle Wyatt was born and bred in San Diego, where she went to Patrick Henry High School and graduated in 1977. By October of 1980, she was attending Grossmont College and working as a side hustle as a cashier at a Mission Hills Safeway store. People knew her as a driven woman who was very independent. Her father, Raymond Wyatt, testified to that. She also had good grades, and from a very young age, she was clear about what she wanted from life. She also loved the great outdoors and engaged in activities like scuba diving and skating. Friends spoke about how sweet she was and how hard it was for her to say or do anything that would hurt anyone's feelings. On the 9th of October, 1980, and in the hours before the terrible attack, Michelle Wyatt had spent time with her boyfriend, hanging out, playing pool, and just having fun. Then shortly after midnight, around 1 a.m., her boyfriend left, locking the door behind him. And sometimes after that, residents in neighboring condos heard a scream coming from a condo. No one called 911. The person screaming was Michelle Wyatt. There was no sign of forced entry, and it looked like the individual that committed the act had just walked straight in. The crime scene was taped. Statements were taken in, and clues were sought endlessly, but still, the case confounded every investigator that picked up the file. DNA, which seemed to be the white knight in every tale of homicide, wasn't helpful. After a lot of work with little to no effort to show for it, the case was closed for years until a retired San Diego sex crime and homicide detective decided to pick up the case. He began to deduce what might have happened that night that would have caused the killer to get into a door without having to force it open. He theorized that Wyatt was unlikely to open a door for a stranger at that time. He said that the killer must have been watching her and almost definitely knocked on her door mere moments after her boyfriend left to give the impression that it was her boyfriend at the door who had maybe forgotten something. In June 2000, more DNA testing revealed that there were two DNA profiles on the crime scene. One was her boyfriend, who was later eliminated as a suspect, and the other was an unidentified person whose DNA produced no match on the National DNA Criminal Database. Two decades would pass, and they tried yet again to see if a match would be produced. Yet again, they found nothing. It was when they decided to use genetic genealogy that they began to see progress and the homicide investigators finally identified a suspect. A man named John Patrick Hogan was just 18 years old when Wyatt was killed. However, no arrest could be made because Hogan had died 17 years ago at the age of 42 from a drug overdose on October 9, 2004. This discovery was made through the use of genetic genealogy, and this was exactly 24 years from the day Wyatt was killed by him. Hogan's death meant that the detectives tracked down his relatives, who then provided DNA samples to help to confirm his identity. After he was positively identified as the killer, it was found that Hogan was born in Arizona and had once lived in the same condo where he would later kill Wyatt. He had moved there in the 1970s and still had friends in the complex when he committed the terrible crime. Shortly before the killing, he had joined the Air Force and he had also spent a brief time in New Mexico 
where he was stationed. Subsequently, and during the time of the crime, he was shuttling between his birthplace, Arizona and California. Detective Lieutenant Tom Seaver, who had been supervising the case, made it clear what would have happened if he were still alive. He's the one that committed the sexual assault and murder. He would be arrested if he was alive. Michelle's parents, who are both aged 80, had spent most of their lives pursuing this case and trying to find their daughter's killer to no avail. When the news got to them, they were not sure how to feel or react. They missed their daughter, but they also wished they could confront the man who killed her. Michelle's mother, Louise, had this to say. Okay, he's dead, but I would have liked to have been able to talk to this man personally. I just feel horrible for the ending. Ultimately, Michelle Wyatt's parents were grateful to the detectives for pursuing for over 40 years on a case that many others would have abandoned and forgotten. The man who committed the crime might have met his end, but at the very least, the questions the victim's family had always wanted for some semblance of closure had finally been answered. Plus, the spirit of Michelle Wyatt can now peacefully rest. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this episode. If you don't want to miss any content coming from this channel, click the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel, like, share, and leave a comment to let us know what you think of the cases we treated.